we've done punch cards already, but we've not really talked about tape input solutions for old computers. I think the thing to make very clear to people, of course, is that this really goes back a long way, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Of course, it can't come out of the computer industry. It came out of the telegraph industry. There they were, you know, sending telegraph signals, initially by Morse, but then somebody came along and said, look, rather than using Morse, why not have a fixed length code of, well, they wouldn't have called it a five bit code, but that's what we would call it nowadays. It is, it's a five bit code. Two to the power of five is 32. There were 32 possible characters that you could signal in five bits. Don't get confused by this small running set of holes down the middle. Those are the sprocket holes. And whether you're reading or punching this tape, you've got to have some motive force. You've got to be able to drive it forwards, as it were. And typically on mechanical systems, um, a uh, toothed wheel will engage in these so-called sprocket holes and will pull the thing forward. But a completely separate set of circular punches below will, every time you press a key, put a hole pattern, as you can see, going horizontally into this tape. So this particular code in five bits was originally invented by a Frenchman called Bordeaux and it was very successful, although he didn't actually tie it into a proper typewriter. He had his own, I think, five key funny weird thing that you wiggled about a bit in order to make the hole punchings work. A gentleman called Murray had the idea of why not link this to a proper typewriter. So every time you type an A, it punches out the five hole code for A. He worked for a telegraph company as well. He said, look, if we're going to be punching holes to correspond to characters, every time you punch one of these big holes, it wears out that hole punch on your machine. How about saying that for the most common characters in English and in sensible European languages, we will punch the smallest number of holes. That will reduce the wear on the punching mechanism. So yes, when you look at the Bordeaux-Murray code, yeah, Bordeaux's code as adapted by Murray, you will find that the letter E uses precisely one hole going horizontally, and T uses one hole. I think many of you know it goes something like eta o win shroldu in English is the frequency of the letters E T A O I N. Oh yes, you weren't taught how to win shroldu or shroldu no, when no, you went. No. Oh, Sean, you've missed out on a true telecoms education, obviously. Didn't Morse have a similar thing about making? He did. He tried his best, but he uh, he made a few mistakes because he went to uh, a printing shop, a printer's shop. And they were almost right, the, the population of how many E's are there in that box and so on. But yes, you try very hard to do that. Morse was a variable length code, E is one dot, whereas Z is something like three dashes and a dot. This was determined to keep things simple by saying we're going to have a fixed length code. It'll be five bits for every character. It's just that in modern parlance, those big holes represent a one in the code. And if you read across on any single character and you see a space where there could be a hole but there isn't, then that represents a zero. So if it's possible to focus in on this topmost punch character, it's something like, let's read it from left to right, it's one, zero, one, ignore the sprocket holes, zero, one. I hope that's the right way around to read it. But you get the idea. The big holes represent ones in the code. The places where there could be a hole but isn't represent zeros. So reading across any one of these, you get a five hole code. And in special places, you'll even find that the one with all five holes punched is a special reserved symbol. I can't see any of them on here now, but that's used for so-called change of shift. Is that like shift on a keyboard? It is very much like that. It's got the usual problem. OK, you've got 0 to 31, you've got 32 combinations, that's scarcely enough to do the alphabet. By the time you've added 26 alphabetic characters, 10 numbers, that's 36 gone, and you've only got 32. Well, well, what's the story? And the answer is very similar to a typewriter. What you do is you say, okay, 
we're going to have to have reserve codes which say if you hit this code it means change the state of your machine to expect basically numbers and punctuation and then when you're fed up with doing numbers and punctuation you change back into the default letter mode again so whenever you're in so-called letter shift which is the default you can always change into figure shift and when you've done your fours and your fives and your commas and you want to come out of figure shift, you hit the change to letter shift code. Which is fine, it works very well so long as you coherently read the tape in the correct order from start to finish. It can be a bit of a brute if you put a tape on in the middle of itself, thinking you'll be in let letter shift code but you're not. The characters are assuming it's figure shift and the whole thing comes out looking like a mess. Until, fortunately, sometimes it might resynchronize. This is what I did my initial programming on for the Mercury computer owned by the University of London. It was five whole paper tape, the punch machines, the teletypes as we call them, I think were made by a firm called Creed. And yeah, this is what you got out. You punch your program up like this. You took it off to your tape reader in the computer room and it read it in, in five hole code. And that was your program or your data or whatever. The other thing, of course, to be aware of is that Yes, we know now that it's got to be a mechanical process to punch these holes, but what about reading them? If you put them in the re tape reader in the computer room, well again, it would perhaps, if it was slow, <coughs> be sprocket driven down the small holes to drive it forward. But you then have a clear choice. How are you going to sense these holes here on every horizontal row that represent the ones in your character. You've obviously got to sense them and all of the places where you try and sense and you don't succeed, well that's a zero. Well pretty obviously there's two answers. You could do it um, mechanically and slow tape readers did just that. You put the thing in and it went chug 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 along the sprocket holes and you could almost see the sensor rods coming up from un underneath trying to gently push through the holes and if they got through the hole then of course that made a contact and they sense the character as being 101001 whatever but of course if you wanted real fast luxury you sensed photoelectrically and um, that's another thing you've got to remember Einstein won the Nobel Prize for explaining the photoelectric effect in 1905 so it's been known about for a long long time and it did not take electronics engineers long to be able to make small or large photoelectric cells Certainly when I copied these out when I was at London University and put them through the tape copying option at the side of my typewriter because you could plug it in here, make sure you had plenty of blank tape and then you could start the tape reader and believe it or not it would go chug 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 like this. Every time it sensed a character it would type it out on a sheet of paper for me but behind the reader it was chuntering out a copy and punching holes to make an exact replica of this. So that was a truly electromechanical solution. It was going pretty slowly. And you've got all these sort of chads accumulating on the floor and things like this. I'm waiting for the comments about hanging chads. I mean, yeah. Was there such a thing? Well, there could be. But it was less of a problem for some reason, I think, in paper tape. But yeah, there, there was a... I mean, Murray was right. There was a problem with wear. You know, you, if you were doing frequent tape punching, you really had to make sure that the holes were <laughs> absolutely correctly punched. So there we are then. I mean, that's five hole paper tape technology. By the time you get to seven and eight bit ASCII, you don't want to be mucking about with figure shift and letter shift. And of course, that was the thing about the initially seven hole 128 ASCII options. And later, of course, the extension to eight hole uh, working and the ISO alphabet 256 and all that is you needed, obviously, seven hole tape or eight hole tape or something like this but certainly not five. The 16-bit microprocessors could not use the bandwidth that was available in the memory that people put in these machines. So you'd spent your money, you bought some bandwidth and then you were coupling this to a processor that couldn't use that basic resource and this just struck us as wrong. 